And hello, Raj. Thank you very much uh, for a very nice introduction. And hello to all of our participants. Hello from Japan. As we say, Kombonwa. It's uh, 11 p.m. here. We have different say of greeting. So now it's evening and we say Kombonwa here. I'm uh, Faiza Mahichi. I'm an associate professor in Ritsumeki and Asia Pacific University in Kyushu Island in Japan. And probably you have maybe done some of your research. You know, our university is very unique. It's the true international university. Half of our students are international. And also we have a very large percentage of our faculty and also staff as well international. As you can see, my colleague Samuel here is also international staff in our university. And also I'm originally from Iran. Uh, today, we will uh, have the chance to introduce our program. This is a dual master degree program between our university in Japan in APU and our partner university in Germany, Terrier Applied Science University. So my colleague, uh, Dr. Michael Kenos, will introduce our IMAT dual master degree that you will receive at the end of two years of a study, one master degree from our university in Japan, APU, and the second master from our partner university in Germany. So as I mentioned, uh, our university, not only being uh, true international is unique, but also the place that our university is located is also making our university a very unique place to study about economic growth and climate protection, because the university is located in the province, which is the birthplace of the concept of OVOP, one village, one product concept. So without any further ado, I want to pass the talk to my very dear colleague, Dr. Michael Kanos from our partner university in the Terrier Applied Science University. Dr. Kanos, please. Thank you, Fase. I am going to start with the topic uh, economic growth and climate protection, whether it's a contradiction or whether these two are basically two sides of the same coin, which we believe and we believe firmly that climate-oriented economic promotion will be the future. I am Michael Knaus. I am 47 years old. I am working in this field since nearly two decades. And I am doing research in climate protection, climate management on an industrial level, but also on the regional or on the city level. So I'm working for the Institute of Applied Material Flow Management, which is a non-profit institute at the German University. The German University is something very special. We are also two decades old. We have nine professors and 80 scientific staff coming from all around the globe. Our fields of expertise are industrial and regional material flow management concepts. We design global circular economy or zero emission strategies for big cities, big companies, or entire nations. We do also technical and economic feasibility studies for different infrastructure projects, <clears throat> management support if someone wants to set up and carbon management. For instance, at the moment, we are developing the entire monitoring, reporting and verification scheme for the carbon balance of Morocco. And we put all these applied research into teachings as we are running a set of different dual degree programs. And the IMAT dual degree program with Japan is one of six at the moment. So our students don't learn from textbooks, but they are learning from case studies, which we are doing globally. During the last 20 years, we have been doing in my international department alone, around about 15 million euros on consultancy projects and 450 projects in 64 states all around the globe in this thematic area. Material flow management, here you see a graphical picture. Basically, we look at the historical development of the material demand, material and energy demand of the society of global streams. And we recognize that if we simply would follow this curve in the development, if all the least developed and middle income country would follow the development trends of Germany and Japan for the last 20 years, our earth would not simply have all the resources and sinks to cope with this demand. As we all know already in April, we have the so-called Earth Overshoot Day. On April, we are already overstretching the Earth's carrying capacity. And basically at the moment, our consumption needs and requires 3.4 Earths to cope with it. So what we do is we try to break this interior and we try to develop so-called circular economy, making more welfare with less environmental impacts.
And some people tend to believe that the way from top emitting to no emitting is a big stress and a big economic burden. We believe that modeling from throughput society into a circular economy is getting so much efficiency potential, so much green business potential, that it must be an economic imperative to do so. And that's um, the theme of today. I would like to explain to you that our throughput society, as we are at the moment, is not having any long-term future. That since uh, the COP16 in Paris some four years ago, we have a commitment on the table that all countries are doing their very best to limit the global warming until the end of this century to 1.5 degrees. And I will show you that at the moment nothing much is happening, but it could be happening so much more if we really believe that all these changes this transitions from throughput to uh, circular from a non-renewable to renewable energy society is an economic business and it could lead to a new green deal what we are discussing at the moment in europe and what is done in germany since many many years so it's nothing new material flow management so in history if we go back until the 70s what we did was so-called end of the pipe we had a production process which looked into the raw material and had some product output and they simply want to minimize the environmental impact at the unwanted product what they call waste so i'll give you an example whenever you had a high amount of emissions in your exhaust gas you simply put in a filter that was end of pipe minimizing saying dilution is the solution to pollution and then the world gets a little bit more clever they develop so-called cleaner production principles they are still out there in many many developing countries where they move the focal point away from the end of source end of pipe towards the production set can we produce cleaner to have less unwanted product less waste and in 1994 when we had the rio conference on sustainable development for the first time the united nation university in tokyo defined zero vision and said, why don't we take this unwanted product as an input material for the next industry and close material loops and have a cascade of value creation? So they call this zero emission. In Germany, we came up with the buzzword material flow management or material and energy flow management. And since 1994, it's the official German governmental policy for environmental protection. But where are we at the moment? What are the global mega trends for the next decade to come and maybe a little bit further? It's the rising demand of energy. So every year it's going to rise by 9% and every five years we are going to add one third of it. We have a total scarcity on resources. If we are looking into electromobility, no one knows where all the precious metals should come from, also for all our mobile phones. We have a tremendous impact on climate change these days, but we also see another mega trend, which is A, the demographic shift, overaging of population, in particular in Japan, in particular in Germany, but also the mega urbanization trend that we see that more and more people are moving from the rural parts into the city parts, and that's leading to a complete diversification of our landscapes. No? So population dynamics is another issue. So no one knows how many people are inhibiting this planet at mid of this century. At the moment, we tend to believe seven to eight to nine billion people, but that could be completely changing. And if everyone is having the same affluent level, the same lifestyle, and already we can't cope with the Earth resources, we either get tremendously more efficient or we need to do something. And we see also that we have some various plaques and disease which minimize, like Malthus doomsdays, um, the population. Now we are in COVID times, so, so we might see a trip here as well, but it certainly bounces back. And then population dynamic, we might see that we get more and more, not even the 10 billion, but even more, no? because Africa was always underpredicted. We always assumed a certain growth in Africa. You see this purple line, and you see that now, after the last consensus, which was done during 2010, it was seen that the fertility rate is way, way higher than predicted, and the death rates of AIDS and other diseases are way, way lower than predicted. So the green line shows that the real population increase in Latin America is significantly lower. And that we could even have 11, 12 billion people at the end of this century. Now, so 
And the other fact is that 70% of the global population will live in cities at the at mid of this century, and that this urbanization trends goes on. If we look into Japan, urbanization trends already have been there since many, many years, with 80%, Germany with 60%, and in global average on the world, 50% are living in urban structures. That means the other 50% are living in rural areas, but this is changing. People are migrating to the city and already put pressure on the city. So if we look into cities in particular in Asia, and so these people, uh, these pictures are from China, where you have a heavy water pollution, where half of the sewage is discharged in water bodies. They have this saying, Panterai, everything which flows is clean. We see tremendous light pollution, so you won't see any stars at the night because it's a complete urban heat island. We see in Italy that waste is accumulating in the streets with all the second infections. In India and in some other parts of the world, we see a heavy noise and air pollution through to condensed traffic because everybody is still infringing on these rights of individual mobility. We see the growth of urban slums, like in um, this is in Hong Kong, but we also see in Rio de Janeiro, we see it in all cities which have an unprecedented growth in a short period of time where city planner could simply not cope with the influx of people. And still, with all this waste, it's out of sight, out of mind mentality. We are going to a junked rural areas where we simply dispose this waste, and that's still our predominant mode of waste management, out of sight, out of mind. We build a hole in the ground, we dump all the material, we put some earth on top and hope that we never see it. If it's not done properly, we have leachate contaminating our groundwater, we have explosions because by the natural decay, CH4, methane gas is producing, and the little infection, and this entire thing is exploding. We have smell, we have odors, we have seven pollutions, infections. We have waste pickers, the poor of the poor, who are living on the landfill, who are manually taking out whatever is valuable. No? So they are sorting already a little bit. Here you see that even dead animals are disposed of. I hope you're not disturbed by these pictures, but these pictures are real. Everybody who was on the landfill side know these things. What you don't see is the sharp needle, the objects and all the healthcare and hospital waste. But that's a tremendous environmental disaster, what we don't see if we are in the middle of the city, because it's usually happening behind our suburbs. And it's this not in my backyard phenomena. Everybody wants to have this as far remote as possible. But the same is with wastewater. We assume that all the wastewaters are treated, but that's wrong at the moment. Currently on the global level, we just treat 20% of the total globally collected occurring wastewater. Half of the wastewater is not collected because we don't have functional sewer grids. And another half of this collected one is not treated that just 30% end up. Here, this is a uh, Tema Bay in uh, Ghana, where you see the brown, that's excrements. No? So the entire non-treated wastewater are discharged basically 150 meters to the shoreline. And if you are unlucky and the wind pushes the waves back, you'll get all these things nicely back on the um, beach. No? It's not so easy to swim at the beach. So that's a river in Peru, in Peru parts where you have a copper and a zinc mine and they are discharging their entire chemical liquids to the nearby water body out of sight, out of mind. And they are endangering the groundwater for nearly 40 million people living in the surroundings. All our lifestyle is costing us so much natural resources like land degradation in Canada, where they are exploring tar sands to produce oil and we are destructing the native forests for producing new agricultural areas for food crops for our animal and livestock industry we are looking in all places here is a phosphorus mine in china in, in mongolia where they extract phosphorus because phosphorus is a precious metal needed for our agriculture for our fertilizer which is phosphorus nitrogen and kalium and we see also in New Zealand where they are digging for osramium, wolfram, plutonium, things what we need for the production of um, mobile phones or some other acid mine drainage in Ecuador where they are looking for cobalt to produce um, batteries for the ever increasing demand of e-batteries. 
That leads to soil erosion, desertification. If the desertification goes on and if there's no backholding capacity of roots, with all little winds, we have air pollution and sandstorms. This is a tremendous loss of habitats. In the last years, we see that we have amount of tornadoes, we have an amount of rain coming in a very short period of time, but for the remaining part of the year we have the hottest years. So the last 18 years had been the hottest ever since temperature recording and every year is a new threshold limit, every year is a new record and if we look around the globe, whether it's the Sahel zone, whether it's in Brazil, whether it's in India, in China, in Germany, we have a significant amount of droughts. In Germany we studied environmental protection back in 1972 because that was the first report on the dying of forests what we get and at that time the forest had been dying on acid rain which was um, based on the sulfurous exhaust of um, coal power stations. We got that because at the end of pipe we put some filter so the forest recovered slightly to 80 percent by the beginning of century and now for 20 years we have troughs. Now we get all the fungi, we get all the forests dying again because we do not have enough water. If we put all these extreme weather events, whether it's a flood, whether it's a drought, whether it's a hurricane, if we put all these things together and if we look into the damages, and that's from a, a so-called reinsurance company, the Munich Reassurance, they are insuring insurance companies against their climate risks. If we put them together every year, we have a depth around 300 billion US dollars. If we put that as a GDP of a country, this country would be ranked number 32 in the world. In total, all these steps are accounting to 0.5% of the total global gross domestic product. So climate change and its induced damages is seriously threatening the world. A couple of 20 years ago, there was Sir Nicholas Stern and I to the Green who predicted if we are not investing 1% of our GDP into climate mitigation and adaptation for the next 20 years, saying from 2000 to 2020, we will see losses on an unpredicted range. Nobody believed this guy, also he was a knight, and now we are seeing that every year we have new records, new extreme events leading to new environmental damages. No? Not to speak of the Antarctic and Arctis, where we see in Greenland the calving of icebergs, where we see that the Bering Sea is completely out of ice for nearly half of the year, where we see massive holes in the big ice shelf of the Antarctic, and where we see that in 20 years we won't have Greenland anymore covered with ice. So already the Kilimanjaro, the nice mountain in Africa, which has this nice silver hut, the glacier is already gone, and many, many other glaciers will follow. And that ice is stored water, which is then coming up as drinking water over the years. So with the de-icing, we don't even have just the problem of increasing our oceans and therefore having climate refugees, but we also have a pressure on our water supply system. So if we look into this, so, so the fossil CO2 emission scenarios, it's very clear. Now in 2000, we are on the turning point. So if the scenarios goes on without any climate policies, it really goes like this, because the energy demand is ever skyrocketing. And if we are following the Paris Accords, we need to go down this until a complete 100% renewable society by 2050. We need to do that because at the moment we are in the so-called ecological debt. That means we are living beyond our means. And if we want to avoid that, we need to go down this path to have some ecological reserves anymore. I'm not talking about global biodiversity and extinctions of species. This is a complete disaster. No? But uh, if we look into the temperature records, this is over the last 50 years, the records and every year we are spiking out and in 2015 we already spiked in the global mean temperature above the 1.5 target which is accepted and we are going up this trend. That means in 2037 is another turning point where we can't influence anymore whether we are going to achieve the Paris Accord or not. 
Paris Accord is uh, based on the COP, the Conference of Party number 16, so the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. They are meeting every year if there's no pandemic and discussing who is going to take which abatement burden so which country is going to go into full renewables into 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 so it's established since 1994 we had a kind of a carbon trading area between 2008 until 2012 and since 2012 until 2018 we were without any schedule we are debating how can we globally set up a kind of a generation contract where we are saving the planet for our future generations and there are so many pledges on the table and everybody says okay i could do something but i need to have finance because everybody from the politician side believes we just can reduce our emissions if we get paid because reducing emission is an economic disaster. You need to pay a lot of money, a lot of subsidies, and we simply can't afford that because we want to ensure economic growth in order to generate welfare for our population and our population, our voters, and our voters are going to keep us in power. Yeah? That's the situation, what we see. And if we really seriously look at what had been negotiated in Paris and if we look into the trend curves of CO2 emission we would recognize that in 2037-2038 the total CO2 budget for the remaining of this century is gone. That means after 2037 we won't be able to emit any CO2 equivalents emissions anymore if we would take this 1.5 degrees serious. In terms, it means if we can't emit, we can't produce energy by fossil fuels, we can't have any transport by fossil fuels, so we have the need for a 100% renewable energy society in electricity, in heat, in cold, in mobility. At the moment, we are far away from that. That means that there needs to be massive investments in renewable energy, energy efficiency, circular economy, into all sorts of new green economies. Otherwise, we won't be able to prevent climate change from happening. And I'm not going to go on the negative sides of the consequences, but for those who are interested, there's a nice book. It's called Six Degrees from Ken Flannery. It describes the possible scenarios of one degree, two degrees, three, four, five, six degrees temperature increases and what that would mean to the global population in 2050. So trust me, you don't want to see an increase above three degrees. Uh, already three degrees is a major disaster, but we need to take this as a precautionary principle and we should make sure that we stick within the 1.5 degrees. So we see that every year we are building up 9% more energy production capacity. And for the first time in 2017, we saw that two thirds of the investment went into renewable energy generation, while just one third went into fossil or nuclear power, which is still way too much, but at least we have a reverse of trends. Everybody is now believing that the renewable energies are mature. Still, if you look into which countries have which type of renewable energy policies, we don't find much. Germany is trying to have at least 80% covered by renewables by 2050 and 100 by the end of the century. We just have Denmark and we have a few others who are trusting to have a 100% renewable energy target by 2015. So, Transport, we see some movements now that uh, electronic vehicles passed the 3 million marks in 2017, but it's still just 1% of the total light vehicle market. So we don't talk about the big ships, we don't talk about airplanes, we don't talk about massive lorries, we just talk about cars. And in cars, we reach 1% of the light vehicle market, and we have 0.05% of big transports. So we are way, way, way high. So there is no need to celebrate. Also in electricity, we are producing already 30% globally by renewables, but 30 is not 70. If we look into heating and cooling, we see that around about 50% uh, is still conventional and all others are renewables. And there is so much efficiency potential in heat energy. So how do we heat up our buildings? How do we produce steam? How can we recirculate steam in industry? 
buildings could be easily being converted into positive energy constructive buildings and that's an area which could be easily tackled transport i don't talk much about transport but transport is the big big topic of the future i do believe that for electricity we don't have a big generation or we don't have a big um problem of getting 100% electricity because the uh, technologies are mature and we could simply turn them into hydrogen, hydrogen into fuel cell and back into electricity. So there is not need for giant storage, but energy efficiency is a big, big topic. So if we look into the Paris 2020 interims um, targets and they just released that from the World Resource Institute. They looked at renewables in electricity there is a little bit of progress but if we look into no new coal fire should be built it's no progress at all everybody's building coal fire plants then we look electricity vehicles should be 15 to 20 percent we are way way ahead heavy duty vehicles 20 percent way way ahead if we look into land use we are way way ahead so i trust you get this as a movie then you could slowly play it or you go on the world resource Institute's website, tracking the Paris progress, you get this nice data sheet and you see that we are always off the track or in insufficient progress. So again, in all categories, what we need to achieve until 2037, and 2037 are 17 years. I'm now 20 years in this university for my working life, so I know how 20 years pass by, it pass by like nothing. And we haven't achieved much. So what we do is uh, what we firmly believe, the population is just looking at this throughput society because they are used to import energy material flows. They are used to pay money for this because they are not used to use their own potential. And everybody looks into so-called low capex, high opex so for the MBAs, low capital investitures, but a high operating expenditure means I don't want to invest much at the beginning. I don't care how much I spend every year for the operation. So we are saving on the wrong side. So what we do, what we firmly believe is if we create transparency on the potentials, we could easily minimize our dependency from energy inflows and we are saving the outflow of money and we could produce environmental protection and regional added value. I'll give you an example from the so-called um, resource and energy efficiency checks, what we do in industries. We have been doing this globally in Mexico, Costa Rica, Guatemala. We had been doing this in textile industries, in food industries, in wind turbine manufacturers, in uh, bottled liquor, in um, high-end luxury hotels. It's always the same. So you reduce the resource costs simply by creating transparency and defining investment objectives. So we start to analyze what is the status quo of the energy demand and carbon emissions. Then we look into how much can we save if we do not invest at all, if we just make capacity building, a grading awareness for the people. And then how much can we save what we define as must-haves? Because you have your money back within a year. And how much can we do if we still have our money quite fast back, but it's technically a little bit complex. And from all the work what we've been doing, and we have been working in nearly 40 industries all around the globe, we easily see that 50% of the total energy demand could be saved easily. With a little bit of long-term cooperation, nearly 40% is remaining. And then we are looking for sources how to turn this 40% into renewables. That's our strategy. And we always look into lighting, compressed air, pumping system, cooling, heat supply, because there are tremendous efficiency potentials in that. Now, this is a picture of a basement of a food industry. So this food industry has round about the installed pumping capacity of a middle-sized city for 25,000 people. And pumps are 20% of the total industrial electricity demand or 4% of the global electricity demand are going into pumps because we are constantly pumping fluids from A to B. And these pumps are A, seldomly dimensioned right. They seldomly have a so-called frequency converter, so they are just running 24 seven. And that loses up to 40% of unnecessary electricity consumption. 
I don't go into details, but basically the engineering is that you look into the operating house, the install capacity, you calculate the consumption, then you look into the efficiency. You would easily build up the new efficiency, converting and saving 25 to 40 percent of installed capacity. With the operating house, you get the energy savings. With the energy price, you get the capital savings. And with that, you divide this by the initial investment. And you conclude, if you build up a new pump, you get your money back in two years. And some of the food industries we are working with, they are operating with the pump since 25 years already, meaning 20, 30 years, they are wasting a lot of money. You know, LED light bulbs in street lights, or here is one example for the TA, the so-called office light. If you replace this by a decent LED light, you have your money back within one lighting year. And they are providing 40 to 50,000 operating hours, means it lasts for 12 to 15 years. So you're saving a hell of a lot of money and you're just purchasing them once. Behavior management, simple, in Costa Rica, a big dairy farm, everybody was running their coolers by 80 degrees, which you don't see here. It was freezing cold, everybody had on his jacket. We said, why don't you put up 23 degrees, allow the people to go without jacket. That's Japan doing after Fukushima. You could easily save in this office alone with five split coolers and the neighboring office, another five split coolers, 80,000 US dollar, and you have thermal comfort because now the people are ill, it's free, and if they go up by 30 degrees, they are hit by a wave and you could easily avoid that and save a lot of money. Cooling infrastructure the same, you could take old coolers out, build new coolers with a so-called coefficient of performance, which produces double the amount of cold water than with the previous one, and you get your money back in four years. That cooler was 12 years old already, so it means eight years they wasted money. Steam in industry is another thing. Everybody in industry needs a hell lot of steam. Steam generation is roughly 40% of the total fossil fuel energy demand. Steam is used to heat uh, in any, any food industries and in order to avoid cross um, condemnation of the steam and food, they are blowing down the steam away. They are blowing out the steam, recharging the steam system with hot water, heating up the water until it guts the steam. And that's an enormous amount of monetary losses. And there are leakage detectors where you could detect uh, any crossover calculations of steam and you could easily get your money back in two months. No? That's still not widely applied in industries. Or if you do the thermal imaging, if you would isolate these pipes where they put through hot fluids or steam, you could get your money back below one year and they've already opened this equipment since many, many years. I'm jumping over the wastewater. Wastewater is another issue. Wastewater usually consists of 5% of the total community electricity demand. There are various attempts to a, improve the energy efficiency of old wastewater equipment like blowers, aerators or pumps, achieving 55% efficiency. You could easily use the sludge in so-called anaerobic digestion units. That's an example of Germany, where you produce enough heat and electricity to power the entire um, wastewater treatment facility. Then you could reduce the sludge because sludge is at the moment still disposed of in landfills. So you could reduce it and produce solid phosphorus ashes with so-called pyrolysis units, where you could use heavy contaminated sludge by a combustion process and produce so-called biochar. This biochar is tremendously increasing the water holding capacity. So you could uh, increase the yield if it's applied in agriculture. You see here some outer surface picture and it increases the holding capacity of fertilizer. So it basically improves the um, agriculture without having to risk that we are crossed over spilling any type of um, disease. I'll give you an example now on a city level. So we did a concept note for a complete new city, which will be built in the desert. And that's for 250,000 population equivalent called the Desert Rose. It's oriented in roses. <clears throat> so each rose is um, subject to 5,000 people equivalent, another 1,900 single villas. At the end of this side, we build a solar park with 300 megawatt, which are producing enough electricity. Here we have a central spine. This is where all the shopping malls and the end are located. And on this side, we are producing food, crops, 
and we are building up a little forest and walkways in order to protect from sandstorms which are coming in here. And here we have the heart of everything, that's a so-called eco-park, where we locate all the supply and disposal technologies. So first we start to diagnose the total electricity demand, then we said, okay, let's build a maximum on rooftop as solar plants. And then if we are covering up all these with solar plants here and the rose itself, all the roses could be 100% supplied with solar electricity. Here's already a functional example from Germany where all the houses are fully autark, producing enough electricity to cover their energy demand. We looked into the building code and the cooling energy demand. We said we need to improve the buildings as well. We need to make them high thermal resistant. And then we could, if we follow the German passive house standard, we could cover easily 100% of the total electricity demand, which is in this particular part of the world tremendously higher because it's hot by solar. And here then we have the so-called bioenergy and resource center. This is where we are taking all the waste. The waste will be vacuum channels through all the city, <coughs> separated in different fractions. So all the bio waste will be channeled by vacuum to here. The gray water, so non-heavily contaminated rainwater, will be treated in each rose at the vacuum station and we pump back to the rows and use as irrigation water. The black water with the feces will come and be combined with the um, waste together and produced um, biogas and electricity. So we have the gray water used as irrigation. We have the black water together with the bio waste, which produces a certain amount of sludge for biochar production, which is amount produce a certain amount of anaerobic biogas, which goes into the production of thermal heat, which is turned into cold and electricity. And we are using the biochar plus the remaining treated wastewater on the so-called green belt, that's that one, the greenings below here. Yeah, here, the green belt to produce all the food crops and all other elements. So here are the hydroponics centers. Here we will have kind of indoor agriculture. We are producing around about 50% of all the stable fruits for the entire 250,000 people population equivalent. And we are doing all these with reducing the footprint by 50% compared to comparable Arabic Emirate townships. So with the solar energy production, with the resource management, the avoidance of landfill, there is no waste going to the landfill. There is no wastewater to be treated. It's just process water and treated solid effluent will be used as irrigation water. With the sustainable transport, light transport model, we are reducing the total footprint towards just the half. And we are not doing this only for the sake of greenhouse gas abatement. It's a business model itself. If we produce renewable electricity, it's cheaper than gas built electricity in that area because they have a high solar yield. If we are going into recycling economy, we are generating revenues. If we go into a landfill economy, we have constantly spendings. If we are using and reusing water, which otherwise needs to be produced by sea water and desalination process, we are producing water from our recycling process much cheaper. And if we are producing this greenery area, we are reducing the total temperature of the entire city. So it's an economic imperative. How do we learn about this? Because our university is already an example of this. We are since 20 years, one of the world's greenest university. You see all our roofs are blue. So we are producing roughly 50% of all our electricity demand already on our roofs. Globally, we are number six at the moment in the rankings. In Germany, we are number one. So we are 100% supplied by renewable heat and cold and electricity. And we are striking to get 100% renewable transport. And we are sure we get this within the next two years. So 50% of the electricity is on the roof, but not only on the roof, but also in the hallways integrated into the facades to show that architecture and renewable energy production is not a contradiction. We have a nearby um, 
ecological industrial park where we turn all our bio waste into heat and gas and steam for the industry <coughs> and all our wooden bio waste into district heat and electricity. We are using a solar absorption cooling system, so we are producing first hot water by the sun and this hot water in a Japanese absorption cooling system is turned into cold air. Our buildings are energy positive, so that means that this building doesn't have a heating system and bear in mind in Germany we get minus 15 degrees in winter. We are just recovering the latent heat in the building and use this as a drive energy. And that one is a little bit more expensive, but after 10 years, you have your money back. It has a one meter thick wall with insulation, triple glazed windows and some other technical gadget. That makes this an energy positive building. And if you assume just all buildings would be energy positive, there is close to no demand for any power production anymore. Yes, we live that dream. Unfortunately, uh, it's just here in our Germany, small, unique world. It's not a pilot model, also we are working on that, that all our seven partner universities in IMAT are coming up with the same the university is the lighthouse. Our university is a role model where the student can physically touch and feel and see this zero emission and 100% renewable energy society on a daily basis. And we are teaching this in our IMAT program, IMAT International Material Flow Management. We are trying to educate change makers who understand the basics of the technologies, but who are able to communicate this to the people, who inspire people, and who could demonstrate that all these changes are financially totally interesting. So we are having a Master of Science who moves a little bit more into the um, economic aspects of circular economy and with our dual degree programs we have the engineering part which looks a little bit more into the technology part of you but they are all becoming change maker they should inspire others and they should run around and tell the people look do it it's a business don't be afraid so at the moment we have seven six dual degree programs the one with switch to make an asia pacific in japan but we also have one in morocco with the al Ahwain university where the in the APU, we have the Master of International Cooperation Policy and they concentrate on the policy aspects of sustainable development. In Morocco, they concentrate on renewable energies. In Aquascalientes, Mexico, on robot and automation. In uh, Brazil, they are concentrating a little bit more on industrial material flow management and in Taipei on urban design and architecture. That's the future. So we are growing up Constantly, we are looking into more and more and more partner universities. The green are the old, the reds are the new in transition. So we are setting up at the moment the green MBA in India, at the Hindustan University in Chennai. We are talking with Oman on the special oil and gas based renewable energy transition master's program. We have various leads in Africa. So I tend to believe the IMA network is growing bigger by the year. And in 2030, we would like to have at least 30 universities running with us dual degree programs all around the globe. Students learn the basic aspects of industrial and regional material flow management. They learn the basic aspects of natural science, engineering skills, social skills, but very important business skills. And we teach them how this climate change and this climate world will rule the world in the future as we see a massive carbon finance coming along the way in order to make sure that we at least have a fair chance to achieve the Kyoto and the Paris principles. And we are teaching this very practically. As I said, we are taking our case studies from the research that we are doing in 40 countries all around the world at the moment. We are developing at the moment a bioeconomy strategy for Tonga. We developed a 100% renewable energy concept for the entire nation of Cape Verde. We are developing a complete monitoring, reporting, and verification scheme for Morocco. We are working in China in many, many waste management projects, among others. So these are the latest research which goes with a day delay into teaching in our master's class as case studies. We invite also technical experts to come and teach and explain their technologies. We are taking students out in the field, explaining them in real life, how does this work? And luckily at our university, we have everything and around 50 kilometers away, we have the wind highest, the world highest wind turbine, we have the world modern waste management initiatives. So we do a lot of excursions. So what I conclude is the technical transformation towards renewable and carbon neutrality is feasible. It requires a massive change of financial flows. 
new business models, new entrepreneurs who look into zero emission and cycle economy as a business deal. It requires disruptive innovations and technologies which are already there, but it most requires vision, ambition and communication. And that's one of the most things which our next generation must come up with. They must have a vision, they must be able to have a very ambitious vision and they need to communicate. And therefore, we are educating change maker because we believe that the future is renewable. And I strongly believe the future is yours. You simply need to pick the right program uh, where you combine and understand that combating climate change is just a business opportunity. So therefore, you need to have the education as it's the most powerful weapon, which Nelson Mandela said, and you need to read, 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 read. The second prominent guy, Yoda, who says, read and the force is with you. With that, you're able to read here my email address. If you have further questions, it's m.knaus at umwelt-campus.de. On www.imat-master.com, you see all our dual degree programs. On the Ritsu Makan side, you get the precision information on this one. And if you send an email to imat at umwelt-campus.de, you get in touch with uh, our beloved Aurelie, who is my colleague. She is handling the admissions. Whenever you have a question regarding admissions, you will be in very good hands if you talk to her. And with that, I would like to conclude. Thanks, uh, APU, to giving me the chance to have this masterclass. And I'm now open for any question and answer. Great. Thank you very much, Michael, for your great uh, introduction, for, for your great presentation. It was really interesting to hear all of those things. I would like to uh, to ask you uh, to ask the audience to give their questions now. It is time for the Q and A session, and uh, we will take the time to to answer some questions. Please type in your questions in the Q and A box, and I would like to invite uh, Samuel. Beto, to uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, the IMAT program and the MBA, MBA program that uh, is available at uh, Asia Pacific University. Hello, Samuel. How, is, how, is, how are things in, in Japan? All right. Thank you very much, uh, Diraj, for introducing me and Michael. As always, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, and as always, I am kind of on the edge of my seat, just thinking about everything that you've said. Uh, but I want to quickly, um, things in Japan are are going uh, as uh, better than in many places, certainly, uh, and certainly where we're located, where APU is located in southern Japan. Um, comparatively speaking, things are pretty quiet here. Um, very few cases of COVID uh and our students are starting to trickle back into the university which is a sight for sore eyes um i want to quickly share about our place in this picture that uh, michael has painted um and so i'm going to share my slides here hopefully uh am i am i sharing them successfully yes okay uh -huh yeah okay great so um just quickly about apu itself so as michael mentioned we are um a partner university with ifas um, one of the earlier ones and uh we are located in southern japan this is our campus um it's not at the level of uh green or renewable energies that it should be and uh, i'm hoping in the near future that changes to match what is presented by ifs itself but we are certainly in a location with lots of potential um just quickly about the university overall we have a very small overall graduate program um very low uh student to teacher ratio a lot of you know emphasis on discussions and uh a lot of what we like to uh, do at our university is kind of focus on and feature the backgrounds of our students who come from all over the world and who are coming from really diverse not only uh, cultural backgrounds but work backgrounds and socioeconomic backgrounds and ideas about um, everything so 
it's a good place to compare your preconceptions or uh, to kind of really develop on on your views and to progress, especially when it comes to this field that we're talking about, renewable energies and pushing forward the, the green transition. Um, I'd be curious to know, you know, if that that amount that Michael mentioned, the GDP being around the 32nd in the world of the country, represented by the losses from climate change, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was actually a bit higher on the on the list now, if that number was not much higher at this stage. Um, but one good bit of news and one thing that should be relevant to people watching this is that actually Japan just recently, the prime minister, the new prime minister announced a 100% uh, zero emissions target by 2050. Um, a bit overdue and still needs details, but it's something that, uh, again, puts us in a position to be able to help you as potential IMAT students or potential MBA students uh, become these change makers, these, these visionaries that are needed, um, because we're now in one of the few countries that nationally has decided to really move forward into the future that is really ne necessary. Um, so I'm kind of skipping out of my slide a bit, but uh, as Dr. Knauf mentioned, um, APU kind of does focus more a bit on the, the policy side, on understanding the political and especially internationally, the environment that is needed to navigate to really push these engineering and business principles through and get them into the heads of people that hold power. Um, which is an incredibly important skill because I think many of us can can determine uh, that much of the problem just comes from stubbornness and an unwillingness to let go of preconceptions. And that's something that APU is uniquely positioned to, to help people with, uh, exposing you to really different people and engaging with um, new and very different ideas and adaptability. Um, so just a quick picture of what the first and second year, first year at APU in our sustainability science division, um, covering a range of things, but related to uh, policy and environmental sciences, um, law, economics, et cetera. And then in the second year, at IFAS, studying, as Dr. Knauth mentioned, natural sciences, engineering, green business, resource management, um, and also engaging in ideally internships or excursions that really get you in touch with industries regionally and otherwise worldwide that are really trying to connect the dots in this realm. So. Um, going to skip over some of these. Uh, just recent outlook for alumni. I'm at alumni coming through APU. See, there's some of the examples of positions that have, uh, that students graduating recently have, have been able to get um, coming out of our IMAT program. So it really does, as you can see from Michael's presentation, it really is mission driven. It's really driven by this strong and you know conviction about what needs to happen soon now and in, in the future and it's also driven by the fact that you can see governments around the world really investing a lot more money in this transition and that puts you in a place to take advantage of that um be part of that change positive change and to take you know and to benefit greatly from it lots of positions coming out of that um, He's one of our alumni, uh, and uh, Qin, who is project manager at Taitra in uh, Taiwan, one of the first batch IMAT students. Um, oh, I skipped over a couple slides here. We also had an alumni uh, from Germany. Um, I'm sorry, I'm missing the slide, um, but he was actually part of the development of a large solar uh, panel um, installment just in the neighboring town 
called Hiji near APU, um, one of our graduates, but it was a very large project and it was quite something to behold still is. Um, quickly, so some of these things I would be, I think better to answer over email, you know, interacting with people who reach out to us. So just quickly though, the admission fee total for this two year program is, uh, around 26,000 US dollars. There's additional fees for the IMAP program, um, which aren't covered in this. So again, details can be shared uh, in follow-up questions, but we do offer scholarships to all applicants. Um, eligible applicants can receive up to 100% tuition reduction. Many students, most graduate students coming to Japan receive uh, JASO scholarship, which covers around $450 a month for the first six months. Um, although this isn't a guarantee that we can offer this, it's just something that uh, to consider. Um, similarly, in Germany, there is a, a research subsidy that is offered to graduate students. So, um, quickly, application process is all online, it's all within our admissions website. And you can see the link on the top left there. You go through, apply online, um, fill out the application form, upload your research proposal. This is one of the really important aspects of the application, especially for your, your tuition reduction scholarship. Uh, looking at your research proposal, looking at your previous work experience and how you tie that into to this program. Um, transcripts, of course, everything. That you need to upload you can submit that and then you pay the application fee and take the online assessment and once you've done that your application is considered complete um upcoming deadlines the next upcoming deadline oh stop sharing there oh no there we go uh the next upcoming deadline is february 24th um, the final deadline to apply for the IMAP program through APU is April 14th, 2021. Um, if you can apply earlier though, it will, it will definitely help your chances of receiving a better scholarship. And yeah, that's all from my end. My name is Sam. I don't think I, I should have covered this a bit better in the earlier part, but um, I am Sam. I am an admissions counselor at APU covering the graduate schools overall. Uh, and of course the IMAT program as well and you can reach me at the first email on the top here otherwise uh, you can reach the IMAT office on the second email you, Michael also provided his email earlier um, and then our coordinator Professor Mahichi at APU who spoke in the beginning can be reached at the below below there so yeah uh, Thank you for joining. Thank you very much. Again, thank you, Michael, for presenting. And thank you, Professor Mahichi, uh, for the introduction at the beginning. And hopefully we get some questions now. Okay, thank you very much for, for this presentation. Uh, Michael, do you have anything to add to, to, this, uh, to this presentation as well? You have to unmute yourself first. Okay, there seems to be some kind of a problem with the sound, maybe you can, uh, you can uh, turn yourself off and then uh, join us back. And I will give you uh, the first question on admissions uh, so that uh, Samuel and uh, Faisa can uh, elaborate on that one. So the uh, the first question on admission was, do we need a GMAT to apply? Uh, you, you do not. Um, so certainly if you apply with a GMAT or a GRE, it can, it can help uh, from the admissions side, it can help boost your overall application, but it's not required. 
Okay, great. Uh, are there any other tests that uh, you, that students have to take in order to, to get, gain admission? Can you describe us the whole admission process just in a few steps? Yeah, mainly. Um, so the application form itself is pretty state, straightforward. Uh, we, the main sort of test requirement, if there's any, is just uh, English language proficiency. Tests for those coming from countries where English is not the language, the first language. Um, so that could be either if you did your undergraduate in English or if you present one of the you know, TOEFL or IELTS scores. Um, but again, I can provide more details on that. Uh, it was in my presentation, but. Um, and then at the end of submitting the application, you will take an online assessment, which includes just a few multiple choice two multiple choice tests uh, covering kind of critical thinking, verbal reasoning, <clears throat> um, and then a recorded one-way video interview. And that's our way of getting a sense of your, you know, your motivations uh, and your ability to connect what you've done in the past and what you've studied in the past with the program that you're applying to. Great, thank you very much. Uh, there is a question here by Hamza Farouk, who, who is asking us, uh, I want to study MBA or Master's in Engineering Sciences. Um, and maybe you can you can tell us if uh, which option is uh, better for him and how to make his choice, depending on his probably experience and field of study so far. Professor, do either of you want to address that, Professor Mahichi or Professor Knaus? How shall I give a young man a counseling without knowing his full CV and interest and haven't seen him and talked to him? Any answer to this could be either completely right or completely wrong or somewhere in the middle. So no, we need to have the CV, we need to talk and see. I never admit anybody without having spoken to him. I would just emphasize one which I forgot. APU is the longest ally in this um, joint program in 16 years. For we had already 250 graduates now as alumni from 45 countries working all in high-end positions. And um, the fascinating thing of the dual degree program is that everybody is having such a complete diverse background and we are looking completely on different things. I'm more the engineer who look into sustainable cities from the engineering and the pure financial background, while FASE is more interested in cultural values, in what motivates people as a social cohesion, how do we strike them with organic food, what is neighborhood. So maybe FASE you can spend a little bit more on that. So what you basically get is the best of two worlds. You get the hard engineering side from the German perspective, and you get this soft into the society side from Japan, who is completely leading in that one. And that embraces us in the ability to really convince people to go into a change because the people, the world is not only hardware, it's also software, it's about emotion, it's about feeling, it's about being inspired. And that's what the FASE does. And I'm teaching the hard engineering stuff. And I think this is the right combination. If you have a feeling for circular economy, if you want to add something to the climate change contribution that we combat it, because you get, you have the choices and you could make choices. You could come in as an engineer, and you end up as a social scientist, or it's the other way around. The picture which Sam didn't show was a student of us who came from Canada. He was an English teacher. He went into the program and his father was an oil drilling engineer. And he said to his son, you never make it an engineer. And he met an engineer and now he's heading one of the biggest renewable energy fund of Japan, he already invested 3.8 billion US dollar in renewable energy plants in Japan, and he was doing the complete outline of one of the biggest solar plants with 60 megawatts just in the vicinity of APU. And he's now a full fledged engineer. And we had computer engineers coming in, and they turned out to be brilliant social scientists. So IMAT could also change the way you think and change your interests, huh? and therefore it's good that we have professors with a range of coming from social science, also FASE is a trained biological on background natural science. I'm a trained economist, has developed a passion for engineering. So we can't answer a question of simply 
I would like to study engineering, what is best for me. No, we need to see the person, we need to know what motivates him or her and where can we develop him for his best interest. Fazer, want to add something? Thank you very much, Michael. You beautifully actually answered the question. As Michael said, I'm also a scientist. I'm a, a actually nano world scientist and uh, uh, biotechnology and uh, actually uh, I'm an environmental microbiologist. Uh, so I've studied uh, biology all my uh, study time till my end of PhD, my master and PhD in Japan. But after coming to APU and uh, collaborating with uh, IFAS for all these many years, I learned that I need to come out of this nano world and look at the bigger picture. And uh, yes, we have seen many, many students from different disciplines coming and joining us because in this combat for the climate change and having a efficiency of using our materials and all the resources, we need different people with different background, with different interests, all of us to communicate together. I think over all these years, of for the last 10 years and have almost 11 years working in APU and collaborating with IFAS, I learned science communication. This is actually what I'm practicing. I'm looking at the traditional practice, traditional knowledge, how those science from the experience of our ancestors have been contributing to sustainability, our sustainable practice, and what science now can add on to those and also can help us to have a more efficiency in our practices. So yes, I totally agree with Michael. We need to see the student interest, their background and their skill and the knowledge to offer you some of our programs. Yes, thank you very much. I think, Michael, you beautifully answered that question. And the second thing is what the perfect fit of IMAT is in Japan is the cultural diverse settings. Uh, APU alone has 50% international students, so you see 5,000 international students coming from, from more than 100 countries. And in our class, we used to have between 10 to 20 masters coming at least from 8 to 12 countries. And they are having a completely different background. If you talk to people who are coming from rural parts of Africa and know what a three stone pit is, and others are coming from different mega cities in the States or in Taiwan or, or. So every day you learn something new from the people you are joining. And at the end of your career, you have a lot of places for couch surfing. That's another good advantage. Definitely. But Charles, you can go on with your question and answers. So. Definitely, it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting program, and so it's good that it's quite diverse. Uh, there is a question uh, directly to Dr. Klaus uh, by Adil uh, Kailin, who is asking Dr. Klaus, thank you for the great information about the current situation on the of the energy sector. I am Adil, a graduate student of uh, Almaty University of Power Engineering and Telecommunication in Kazakhstan. I have participated in some energy audits in my country, so I str I'm strongly interested in your field. The question is, uh, do the renewable energy have negative impact on flora and fauna? Does renewable energy have negative impact I on flora I, understand, and fauna? I understand the question. I'm just thinking again which angle you're coming from. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples where it has. In Germany, we started off with um, solar energy as a rooftop program. And then it ended for a while with a green field program where we used arable land to build on solar power, where we converted agricultural land into energy land. That's certainly an impact. And then we considered, no, we shouldn't do that. Why don't we build it along three ways? where already we have a complete different set of biodiversity. So we forbid green field plants and we are now exploring all of our rooftops. Then we, we walked into biomass. Biomass in total in Germany, we have around about 12,000 biomass power stations utilizing a range of 150 million tons of biomass coming mainly from maize. So after a couple of years, we have installed five gigawatt. We saw that our cultural landscape changes. So where we had corn in the past, where we had a different variety of food crops, where we had the change of food crops, we saw constantly maize. And with maize, we saw a lot of monoculture. We saw a lot of pesticides. We saw a lot of impact in our groundwater. And farmers went into 
energy farmers and then we had to rechange them to go into natural protection and energy farmers so we had to learn this lesson okay if you don't do it then they are optimizing the maize production because this optimizes the renewable energy production this optimizes the energy sales optimizes the budget and then we said why don't you use different intercrops with flowers where we can have bumblebees and insects why don't you work with different types of non-organic non-mineral fertilizers and you get the compensation for your biodiversity function and you get your energy sales which is slightly dropping because you're not harvesting 50 tons of fresh matter but 40 tons of fresh matter per hectare so whenever you leave the people the choice without the regulative body around they are going to maximize their value rather than the society value so yes, there are cases where renewable energy are doing the contradiction. They are endangering species, also they should not do it. But having the right legal framework, having the right cases, having the right instruments, having the right incentives and communication, you could turn that back into a structure where renewable energy is a rather gift than a pain in the ass. Pazir? Thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Michael. Um, as you mentioned, it's very important to assess because you need to have a base to compare. So are you comparing the renewable energy with the fossil fuel energy? Of course, the impact will be much less, the damage to flora and fauna. And then the way we are also implementing those fossil fuels, or those uh, renewable energy is also important. As Michael mentioned, so example, in Japan, we are still are cutting, clear cutting some of the forest and some of the vegetation to plant our solar panel. The same thing actually, as Sam was mentioning about some of our, our alumina in Japan, it still is not uh, actually considering to put it on the roof. We don't have any of those in APU ourselves yet. So we are in the, we, from APU, we can see in Hiji, the town that one of our alumni has done it or in the way to Yufuing and another alumni has put it in the forest. Yes, there will be some impact, but uh, if you don't have this uh, new renewable energy, what well, you probably need to use some of those fossil fuels, which will be shipped all the way from Middle East. Yes, in my country, Iran will be happy, or Saudi Arabia for selling those, but shipment of those fossil fuels and then actually utilizing them as a source of energy will also have much bigger impact, I guess, on their on the actual environment compared to the the renewable energy that we have. Okay, I hope that answer your questions, so we can take the next one. Perfect. So uh, the next one is a little bit more related to admissions uh, and to to the way things are going right now. What uh, uh, will the courses be online next year? And uh, Faisal, maybe you can uh, elaborate a little bit more on the format right now. How how are things happening in the university? Is it online? Is it blended, or something else? Okay, Sam, do you, so should I answer this? So right now in APU, we have hybrid classes, meaning that we have uh, in-class face-to-face face -face classes and also online classes. And you're asking about next year, if you're asking me about uh, from a, my point of view from a, as a microbiologist, the way I have seen that we have been working on Corona, probably this virus is gonna stay with us long. I don't really, I haven't seen that much of this collaboration that we are talking in IMAT program from different disciplines and everybody together. I haven't seen it for this virus. So I want to be very optimistic, but the result or the infection that we are seeing is still is rising in Japan too. We have seen actually really recently very jump in the infectious, infected, infected people. Uh, I don't know really we will have fully face-to-face -face classes or we still will have hybrid. In APU we are having the talk that for next semester most likely we are going to have hybrid classes. So we don't know really about the, I don't know, the next year or two years from now, but hopefully it will, uh, this virus will leave us and we will have more, of, more and more of these face-to-face -face classes. We have hybrid classes too, so all classes below 20 students where we can offer the social distancing in the classroom, we will have online. But nevertheless, we have these um, um, online classes in IMAT since a few years. We are putting together all our partner universities and every lecturer of all the partner universities are delivering speeches. 
on a certain topic. So we have, for instance, um, zero emission in industries where all partners get from their perspective and from their industries uh, one showcase. And then we put the students from all the universities together in mixed student groups and they are working on case studies together. So usually we have this uh, so-called networking university e-learning classes with uh, 15 professors coming from 12 different countries and around about 150 students working together all over the globe. So yes, always our, whether we have Corona or not, we have some online classes because the world is a classroom. Yeah? But we hope that the majority of the classes will be delivered on site. Yeah? And I hope to be on site in Japan soon because I could easily walk through the door and now have a drink with Mahmoud. Okay, that's perfect. Uh, the next question that we have is more related to the MBA program. And uh, can you tell us a little? Uh, can you tell us what? Uh, uh, can you tell us what are the the requirements? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, can you tell us what what is the most important part of the MBA application? For for your MBA program, what uh, what should the, I suppose that the candidate means which of the application stages is most important? Let's say whether whether it will be the tests or uh, the profile of the person, say the CV or any other recommendations that he has to prepare for application. Uh, I, so the one of the most important requirements besides our normal ones, which are having a bachelor's degree and having English proficiency um, is to have three years of full-time work experience. Uh, and that's one difference, again, between the IMAT and the MBA program um, is that the IMAT program does not require that experience to apply, although it's just as beneficial, obviously. Um, but for the MBA program, that is required and you do have to demonstrate that with a certificate of employment or something when applying. And then as far as the weighting, um, or the, the weight of different components, yeah, definitely the, the work experience is weighted a lot. Um, in addition to your study plan, you'll write a, a short essay, uh, well, a two-page essay um, covering your study plan, your intended study plan at APU, which is very important. Uh, of course, your recommendations, your previous grades are important as well, but that, that work experience and how you connect that to APU's environment, to what we offer the professor that your professors that you want to work with. And it's the same thing with the IMAP program as well. Um, connecting what you've done with what you'd like to do and why APU or the program that you're applying to fits into that. Uh, Dr. Knauss, you were waving. You were Great. No, I'm just waving Pazzi a little bit. Oh. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Uh, we are no, approaching the end so, of the Q&A so session. We are also serious. Uh, life is not so serious, and we should not keep that impression that everybody is so serious. Okay. We are approaching the end of the Q&A session, as we don't have uh, too many more questions. So I will ask the last question. If there, are, if there is anyone that would like to ask a question, now is the time. So the final question so far is, uh, do I get a working visa while studying at APU? And I would add to that, uh, is there any grace period for uh, after graduation for finding a job out in Japan? after you graduate from APU? So I think the second part of that question will be good to have Dr. Knaus possibly talk about if he's willing to, um, because for the IMAP program, students graduate presumably while they're in Germany. Um, so it's kind of a different picture. But uh, as for APU, you do not receive, you receive, you're on a student visa when you come um, and you can work part-time while you're on the program, although especially for the IMAP program, it's it can be difficult to to do that, to manage that, unless it's you know teaching, doing TA work, um, which many students do. But uh, as for the grace period, there's about a three-month period that can be applied for after you graduate in Japan to do job hunting activities. Um, and that is kind of the extent of it. If you receive a job offer before you graduate, that then the transition to a work visa is very smooth. It's very easy. 
um, with a job offer in Japan, you you don't really have any obstacles to to living here. So it's that's you know it's kind of a there's little little anxiety about that, but it's just getting the job. <laughs> we do have a career yes, offer to support with that as well. So. Same in Germany. Yeah, you can do part times. So there's a certain limit. So in hours and in the total amount what you're earning. And yes, you have six months for the first phase, and you could extend this to another six months or so full year. We need qualified labor. So please come and say in Germany. Yeah. I guess <laughs> no, that's the truth. Huh? We we are we are lacking one million qualified job in Germany at the moment. If our economy would like to flourish again, we need one million high-paid good labors. No? So please do come. Definitely. Can I add something those. to that? Of course. May come. I add something? So uh, I've been teaching, as I mentioned, in APU almost 11 years, and I finally had my first sabbatical for six months. And I decided to go to Germany because uh, whatever I've been teaching all these years, they are implementing their daily life in Germany. I wanted to go there because I have been attending their conferences, this amazing conference that IFAS is organizing every, every year for circular economy uh, in October. But it was only short time. Within one week, I had to come back because I was teaching in Japan. So I spent, uh, I stayed four months in Germany uh, with the IFAS team. I did some teaching and also research together. And as I said, daily basis, you can see, because I was cycling to university from the place I was staying. So you could see this wind turbine and many, many, everything that we are, you know, I was teaching from the video or the notes that I cannot really have it around to show my student. I was seeing all of those being implemented at the daily basis for German, you know, a life start. They are really practically doing what they are teaching. And many of them, for some Dr. Kanos as well, and Professor Heck have been there to their places. They have all, everything that they are sharing to the, with their students as well. So one more thing I want to add to the question that have been asked, and not only to the question, but to everybody. As uh, Dr. Kanos also mentioned, we have been running this program from 2006 so we have more than 100 students already graduating from APU IMAT, but IMAT as a whole has much more graduates from the program. We have, if you contact us, we can connect you to some of our alumni, which is interested for probably from your home country or exactly the same thing you are interested in. Or I can inter connect you to our, some of our current students uh, in APU as well, either in graduate course or in an uh, undergraduate course. I have done many, many times. Very recently, I've connected one of my own uh, the student from Thailand, who is, she is actually undergraduate and she's just, uh, interested to apply for IMAT next year. I connected her to one of our alumni from IMAT program, who is also Thai and is back to Thailand and working over there. So feel free to contact us. We can connect you to some of our alumni or current students that you can have more information. 